And I've, I believe we have now reached the last session of the Azure Cosmos DB Conf 2021. So thanks to all the speakers that have gone before. We have one session left, and I'm delighted to welcome um, Gary and Amrish from uh, our friends ASOS, who are going to talk about operational triumph with Azure Cosmos DB. Take it away, Amrish. Uh, thanks, Theo. So hello, everyone. Um, some really great sessions today. I definitely learned uh, loads. Um, so hi, I'm Amrish. Uh, welcome to our session on Operational Triumph with Cosmos DB, uh, where we'll look at how ASOS has been using Cosmos DB to achieve success. I'm a solution architect here at ASOS, looking for uh, looking after the order and return domains. I've got here with me my, uh, my colleague, Gary, who will introduce himself. Hi, I'm Gary Strange, a big data architect at ASOS. I work alongside Amrish and other architects delivering data, data solutions. So a little bit about ASOS. So ASOS is a globally distributed online fashion retailer whose aim is to be the number one destination for fashion loving 20 somethings, providing a market leading app and web experience. Since its official release in 2017, ASOS has been using Cosmos DB and all of its uh, different features to reimagine our commerce platform. From millisecond SLAs to the turnkey distribution and infinite scaling potential. So let's look at how Cosmos DB has been vital uh, to our, you know, to be able to conquer our operational data needs um, while remaining flexible for peak periods uh, such as Black Friday. Um, as everyone knows, we operate at huge scale and at a global scale. So let's let's take a look at some numbers um, just to understand what that really means and how we use Cosmos and the rest of the Azure ecosystem to help us achieve that global scale. So we offer our um, app and web experience in 10 languages across 200 markets. We have over 85,000 products on the site at any time. Um, 5,000 new products added every week, and we have an active uh, customer base of 24.9 million customers. Um, in the financial year 20 just gone, um, we actually processed uh, 80.2 million orders. Let's have a look at um, how we're going, where and in our ecosystem we use Cosmos DB. So. We use a microservice architecture, which is made up of many, many services, some of which you can see on the screen today. So our order service being the one that um, where customers can place orders, our pricing system where we can manage our prices for all of our different uh, products, our payment service, which we use to take payments um, and transact with all of our different payment providers, stock and fulfillment services, where we can manage stock availability, as well as manage integrations with carrier uh, management systems and various other aspects of fulfillment. Um, our promotional system um, is you know, heavily utilized, uh, especially for usage um, and we use Cosmos heavily in this area. Our saved item service is one of the largest consumers of Cosmos DB and provides a fantastic experience for customers where they can save all of the different items that um, they want to uh, purchase or they can create boards and share them with their uh, friends and family. Um, we're going to look at why we use Cosmos DB um, just to better understand all of the different aspects around why we prefer this. So first and foremost, we love PaaS and Cosmos DB being a platform as a service offering helps us reduce our operational overheads as well as um, being cost optimal uh, when we want to run our production or most mission critical uh, workloads. Um, we love Nines here at ASOS. So uh, the fact that it, uh, Cosmos DB can uh, provide up to five nines of availability is a huge deal when it comes to providing that great customer experience that everybody uh, knows us for. Um, being schemaless provides us with business agility, being able to uh, adapt and change to business uh, requirements and environments. Um, it's scalable and highly performant. Um, the geo distribution of data, the data partitioning is made easy. Um, because you know provides it out of the box, and we don't have to, to think, but to think too carefully um, about this. But um, having a great uh, partitioning strategy is super important. Um, the latency guarantees on read and write operations helps us focus and fine tune all of that performance that we need down to that 10 millisecond um, 
uh, SLA. Um, the change read has been a real game changer for us to adapt and reimagine our uh, architecture, especially in the commerce area. Next, we'll look at a use case um, around owner management and how we can utilize Cosmos DB to re-architect re the system to be um, operational globally, as well as being resilient and scalable and highly performant. So now that we know where and why we use Cosmos DB, let's take a look at the order service in more detail and how we can leverage uh, Cosmos DB to build a cloud native event driven order processing engine in Azure. So the first thing that we did is we broke that capability into two logical parts. The first being our order booking capability. Um, here it's super important that customers can continue to take, uh, continue to keep placing orders um, and is available globally so that even in the event of a regional outage, we can continue our operations. So Cosmos DB provides all of this capability to us um, with that industry leading geo redundancy and uh, multi-master write features. Next, once we've got all of that data, we can persist all of those requests into um, an Azure Cosmos DB. And then once that is there, we've got the change feed capability, which can then hand off to our order processing capability. So let's have a look at order processing. So order processing, we've re-architected or are, are continuously re-architecting into a serverless event-driven architecture. Here you can see the change feed processing those, those orders coming in, um, emitting out an event. And once that event is uh, published, it goes onto um, our Azure service bus namespaces where a whole orchestration and workflow is managed between all the different um, microservices that we have, whether that's stock allocation, whether that's payment integrations, whether that's fulfillment decisions, discount approvals, fraud, and the list goes on. And all of that is highly scalable. We can adapt and change that workflow however we want. And all of those events being published generates a huge amount of data. And all of that data can be event sourced into a Cosmos DB, um, where we can then project out um, our read models and provide insights to the business to make decisions on how we want to improve performance or change the way that we operate. Um, so all of that, you know, is is really really great having lots and lots of data. And you can see here that Cosmos is fundamental for us to be able to achieve all of that. Um, now that we have the data, um, we need to provide some insights. And so I'm going to hand over to Gary, who will just talk us through about uh, talk us through the ASOS data journey. Over to you, Gary. Thank you, Amrish. Um, so we've had a lot of success with uh, Cosmos DB in our operational microservice domains. However, as technologists, you'll be acutely aware that we need data and data analytics to drive future business success. So in the second half of this session. Um, I'm going to present and share with you some of ASOS's data journey uh, and what we've learned along the way uh, and why we think Cosmos and Event Hubs is actually a really great uh, combo. So, so any data journey has to start with uh, some data pipeline and ingestion. So I'll start there, big data ingestion. So we've got this diverse family of microservices backed by Cosmos DB. Um, and they're transacting high value enterprise messages between each other. And we need to tap into that rich source of data and bring it into our um, enterprise analytics function. And um, so we started that, that journey a few years back uh, and we've learned a lot along the way. Um, and before I get into the journey, I just want to kind of dig into a little more depth on, on what I mean by an, an enterprise analytics function. So, uh, we need to drive analytics for, through data, um, and then we did need to deliver on a number of, number of facets. So what is um, high-stake analytics? Well, we use large volumes of, of data to train uh, machine learning models and develop pricing strategies. And this gives the best price points customer. Um, we're an agile business. We're, we're very agile in our approach to technology. So we want to be able to iterate quickly and, and deliver small changes and observe feedback on the on, and get early results. Uh, for example, A-B testing. 
we want to be able to make sure that the business is, is healthy. So we want to know that our customers are satisfied and they're getting the experience they expect from ASOS. Uh, and, and when we're running promotions, we need to understand in real time that the promotion is, is working effectively um, and we can make tweaks as, as the promotion is live. Um, and we want to optimize our business. We want to try and uh, manage our return rates, make sure we're not um, we're not having too many returns on products. Um, we want to make sure that our marketing spend is really effective. Um, and finally, we, we want to grow our business. We want to continue to grow our customer base and um, and, and convert product searches into purchases. So at the beginning of our, our big data journey, we... Um, we relied on the convenience of that existing microservice microservice architecture that Amrish has explained for us. And it, it was simple enough to sort of plug in um, newly created ingestion services into that existing microservice in, infrastructure. Um, and I'll just explain quickly that, about how fundamentally these microservices generally operate in two modes. So on the diagram here on the left, we've got um, a fat message based uh, architecture. So um, document entity changes in microservices, microservice A um, and microservice B needs to know about that. The full entity is pushed onto a queue and then, then we have a subscriber to that queue that, that, that needs to take another action that the second microservice is. And then in the diagram on the right, we've got um, fin event. So um, customers change their profile or add something to bag, we just send that event and say, oh, they changed their preference. They they put product X in their bag. And then the if the, uh, the subsequent microservice needs to know about the complete state of the bag or the complete state of the co uh, customer profile, they'll make an API callback. So as I said, we, we plugged into these two kind, these two flavors of, of microservice architecture uh, and that got us going uh, in the early days but however we quickly discovered there were some cons to this approach um, so the one big pro was utilizing existing uh, assets Azure assets and in infrastructure but that also came with a con because we didn't really properly segregate our operational infrastructure from our um, analytical workloads so we, we, and we want to have that segregation. We want to be able to have effective management over our uh, mission critical microservices. Um, there's a lack of consistency uh, across APIs. So we're, we're very, as I said, we're very agile with our tech. We, we have a lot of autonomy within the teams. So not every single microservice is, is uh, I well, let's say they have all their nuances and their specialities. They sort of they can be quite diverse. So to integrate with each of them um, wasn't necessarily plain sailing. Um, and then we we could only tap into messages that were available at the time when we when we created the integration. And as I said, we've got um, situations where we'd like to look at a large, deep volume of data to tr train a model or do some deep analytics. And um, so that back data simply wasn't available for our uh, plugging into the existing architecture. So we, it was often an, an additional piece of engineering to go and ask uh, and coordinate with the source team and say, all right, we want to get the three years of back data out of your Cosmos DB. Um, and that was challenging uh, and, and a throwaway piece of work. Um, and then also um, when we had an interruption to service um, on the analytical integrations and perhaps we'd missed some messages or lost some messages and are unable to attain crucial messages, we'd have to go back and say, Can, you know, we've missed these messages, we, we need them, we, we're missing data. And then that would also be not a non-trivial exercise to try and get access to that, those historical events, those historical messages. So I'd, before I talk about how we kind of our journey on on, on uh, addressing some of these cons, I want to talk a little bit about uh, boundaries and ownership. So a naive approach might be to say, well, we'll we'll, you, we'll build some ingestion services. We'll have this centralized data team, and they'll they'll uh, they'll reach into the operational stores and, and, and pull off data and as much data they need that they. Uh, to um, hydrate uh, data stores for the analytics functions. 
However, this really doesn't um, separate uh, the, cons the operational and analytical concerns. And um, I can assure you, no team at ASOS will uh, allow uh, another domain to kind of simply dip into their operational uh, systems. They want to have the control and management over those systems. So with this understanding, what we learned where, from where we started from, we came up with some uh, integration objectives um, that, we, we, that we'd like to incorporate in a new approach. Um, so firstly, we wanted to access this rich, these rich sources of data from an offline state. We don't want to be interacting directly in any way with that operational Cosmos DB because it's so mission critical, we can't take the risk of interruption to service. We want to be able to replay data from an arbitrary point in time. So again, coming back to that scenario where we need to go back in time and get huge volumes of data, we wanted that to be quite a seamless activity, not a big engineering um, exercise. And then we, as I said, we we want large volumes of data, but we also want to be able to look at uh, more real-time signals, as I said, you know, monitoring the, the, the performance of a promotion and other signals and behaviors of, of, of what's happening now in the business. So we want that fast layer as well. So we want both fast and batch access to data and develop a Lambda architecture. So that led us to a conceptual model um, and before I get into uh, into this slide, it may look like there's a ship stuck in a very narrow canal, um, but that's that wasn't what I was trying to do. And I actually built this slide long before the, the Suez blockage. <laughs> um, so let me explain. So on the left, we've got the uh, the microservices. They're very, as I said, mentioned, very diverse family of microservices backed by Cosmos DB. Uh, and what we want to be able to achieve is that. Those microservices take it take the responsibility of, of taking the, the the their data and the nuances in their services uh, and build packaging that data into boxes into uniform containers. And if it, if we can get each one of those to take their their special data and put it into boxes, the operation of taking it from the operational uh, domains to the analytical functions becomes very simple. It's going to take a box from source A and we stick it in destination uh, B. And then if for each analytical function, we open the box up and we pull out the data we want and use it to drive those functions. So that's conceptually what we want to achieve. And then in the next slide, I'm going to talk to you about how we you uh, Cosmos was was ended up being quite a big hero in delivering a sort of a cloud-based solution to that conceptual um, design. So I'll just talk through the architecture here, this, this with, through this high-level diagram. So Cosmos DB on the left there, um, backing our micro, mission-critical, um, highly available microservices. Um, and then we can access that change feed, as, as Amrish mentioned. And with, what we do is we, we use a, a, an Azure function um, to, to take a dependency, a, a trigger dependency on that change feed. And every time a, 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 a document is created or mutated in the Cosmos DB, we get we get those messages, that, that fat state coming through, and we, we play that onto the event hub. Um, and then what that gives us, um, once we've got those messages flowing through onto the event hub, our an, an enterprise analytics function can now say, right, I, you know, I can access this operational data, this high value data through two channels. It's by channel. Um, so in the batch channel, we can use event hub change data capture that's continuously listening to the event hub stream, the messages, and just running it out to Blob, continuously um, packaging it up and put it in a Bob container, and that's completely configurable. And then when we want to look at these sort of more real time signals and want to happen, want to know what's happening right now in the business, we can use uh, stream analytics to also very frictionlessly um, hook into that uh, event hub, and that all happens completely away from that operational uh, Cosmos DB. Um, and you see that the domain the boundaries here are very deliberate. So we want the uh, the source team, the, the team that looks after that mission critical uh, microservice to have the management control over that Azure function, have the management and control over the event hubs. One, so they can control the throttle, the, the, the workload on that change feed. So they can 
they can observe the the pressure on the RU and make decisions about whether they need to upscale or downscale or turn off that uh, Azure function. Uh, and then they can also manage the event hub uh, and, and who can have access to the data. Um, and so you've got the, con the, the, the access control model. Um, and I wanted to really highlight here uh, a, a really neat little um, toggle uh, that's available uh, when you create a, an Azure function that's going to listen to a, a change feed trigger. Um, and, and you configure this start from, from the beginning toggle. The default is false. It will just start reading the change feed as, as, as and when it, it starts up and it's live. But if you toggle the start from the beginning, it, actually you're saying, okay, when you create your leases to to read that change feed, I don't want you to start reading reading the change feed now. You know what's going on now. What I want you to do is I want you to start right from the beginning, the earliest um, uh, event, the er er earliest documents in that container, and then just play through. So if the if the Cosmos DB has been there for a year. You'll start with the very first um, record that was created a year ago and then just play through and eventually it catches up and then you'll read in the here and now. And the nice thing there is that actually through one piece of architecture, through one piece of development, we get we get the two things we're after that that volume, high volume, uh, high value uh, enterprise data um, and the what's happening right now and they come through the same system for the same um, piece of uh, cloud infrastructure and we get our by, by channel output um, and this has been highly effective and successful ASOS so uh, for for example um, we processed three years of data from one of our mission critical systems in just a few hours with one engineer sort of managing the, the change requests and the release and, and observing and taking control and making sure that it all flowed through nicely and there was no interruption to service. And, you know, that's the sort of thing we love uh, at being able to sort of do that low, low effort um, capturing of data. Um, and now, so I talked about specifically about the, the approach in sort of in in a sort of macro level, but I want to talk about now about how that works at scale at ASOS and how we, how this helps us decentralize some of the uh, enterprise analytics um, responsibility. So here it's very similar to the first slide uh, earlier in the session. So uh, for each microservices, they adopt this approach, they pulling the, or pushing the data from their Cosmos DB to Event Hub. And then from there, the enterprise analytics function becomes much simpler. Um, we've got this bi-channel bi output from all these rich sources, and we can just say, right, for this use case, we can tap into these microservices and we can get real-time data. For this use case, we can tap into this uh, subset of uh, microservices and hydrate this uh, ana deep ana analytics system or this machine learning model. And what effectively we've done is distributed some of that effort, some of that responsibility away from like, uh, I guess, a stereotypical data engineering, data analytics team. And, and therefore, um, and we place the control and the ownership and the management in the right place. It should, it should be with that team that's looking after that mission critical uh, Cosmos DB that you know they need to manage it. They need to make sure it's it's highly reliable, highly available, and and the uh, the function of capturing this high value data doesn't mean an interruption or a risk to interruption to service. Um, and this sort of takes us on our early steps towards uh, becoming more of a data mesh orientated uh, uh, enterprise analytics uh, uh, department, I guess. Um, so yeah, that concludes the session today. I, I hope you uh, enjoyed listening in. And uh, I think if we've got a bit of time, we might be able to, to go over any questions that may have come in. Yes, uh, thank you so much for um, the session. It was really great being able to walk through um, where you guys started from the beginning of your architecture and kind of de decoupling um, those services from the operational um, to and the transactional um, sources. Um, I'm sure there's probably um, uh, less uh, supportability uh, tickets coming in um, since you guys have kind of given each of your feature teams um, the responsibility of ownership uh, for, for, for that. Is that right? 
Yeah, that, that's the idea is to try and decentralize some of that effort, that responsibility, because the, the inverse of that is one big team that has to take on all these uh, relationships and and build all this uh, maybe integrations and uh, it just becomes um, a funnel and in decentralizing, uh, we get the scale of effort. Nice. Awesome. Uh, Amrish, um, I, I know you mentioned at the start that uh, change feed was uh, game changing uh, uh, for you. And um, Gary, you, you took us through a, a few of the features of change feed. I wondered if you wanted to maybe pinpoint or articulate what it was exactly about change feed that was, was, had made such a, an impact for you with what we've been doing. Yeah, so essentially, because it's an event-driven system, um, we wanted a way to be able to read um, the log from any point in time. And the other, the other thing is we also wanted it to be able to be scalable. So the fact that we've got a, a constant uh, changing system with lots of requests coming in, and the fact that we have a log of all of those different um, requests coming through meant that we could actually have competing consumers in, in two different regions, um, all uh, processing from, from a, a single change feed if, if we wanted to, or even in a single region. And that gave us the scale um, that we needed to be able to process all of these things in a timely manner. And that was one of the most appealing aspects of this. And the fact that you could, um, like, like Gary touched on, that you could reset um, the pointer back to a, a previous point in time was an, an, a, a really good way of us managing that replay capability that you would see in a typical event-driven system as well. Yeah, I guess just to add to that, um, it, it, we love the control that you can get with the change rate, as I said, and I think you mentioned, you know, that decoupling. Um, so, yeah, maybe we're in a position where um, there's too much demand on that operational system and we can actually just switch it off go right well let's just switch it off we don't you know analytic feeds is our secondary concern mission critical uh, availability is our primary concern and, and we could and then we can switch it on later and it's kind of like we just pause time we you know that's all we do we don't have to like do a whole healing of the system to switch it off okay we get over that hump switch back on and we replay from where we were gives us a lot of agility, a lot of control over the, um, the the movement of data between systems. Going back to the team decentralization and how uh, you know there's different teams working on different sections about microservices, et cetera, um, do you have any tips on how to ensure that knowledge transfer is transferred between the teams so we don't have you know two teams working on the same thing or if someone wants to you know work on something else, they don't have to relearn everything from scratch? sort of things yeah i guess uh, sort of domain knowledge transfer is a is a, a big challenge actually across the enterprise um and once out uh, you know the, there's no silver bullet to it i mean a lot of it is actually building um excellent internal relationships and, and being able to reach out to people and, and and for people not to feel like they can't um make contact or find the right people to talk to so it's all i i <laughs> I describe some of our role. Uh, we might be uh, technical architects, but I do feel that uh, we actually play a role as being cultural architects and try and um, galvanize those relationships and open those pathways and make sure that um, that knowledge transfer has is, is achievable with, with not too much friction. That makes sense. Thanks. Any other questions that we're seeing? Uh, Stephanie or Theo, if not, uh... right. I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. That was really good. Thank you. Right. <laughs> so, what did we think of everything we've just seen? Um, I, 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 you know, I was really kind of uh, blown away by how much intricacy there is in what people are doing out there. Um, you know, they really found creative uh, solutions to problems and leveraging features in Cosmos DB in a, in a very sort of creative and, and impactful way. Especially, I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking about um, 
the tooling that we saw at the, at the start for Emperor's Code and and the uh, um, Havi's uh, 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 tooling and SDK features and, and so on. What do you guys think? Especially around um, the observability aspect, I thought that was really interesting. You know, they they had a need that, that they had, and they found a solution that worked for them, and right. um, they managed to you know improve performance and just improve usability in general by um, and partitioning, especially by uh, coming up with this tool that worked for them. And I, I can see a lot of like uh, I, don't know, I guess the word is synergies that can you know can be applied across um, you know many different uh, uh, users. Um, using these kind of things. So it's great to hear about that. Yeah, just really created a lot of transparency for the user and, and uh, a, a nice little abstraction there. Um, for the, and these are common things that we see customers doing day in, day out, and they just thought about every single one of them and created a nice little feature that helps. Uh, so that was cool. Um, and there's, there was a lot of theme around change feed uh, or around streaming. <laughs> so. <laughs> services but you, you might get the impression that this is a good database for microservices if you're watching this and you probably would be right and so it just seemed to that we had a lot of those uh, uh conversations and and things coming out yeah, yeah. and um not only that but uh data modeling i think that was a big theme yeah. in the conference yeah. is how important actually modeling your data in the beginning is um uh to to the overall integrity of of your applications because um you you'll have to then restructure a lot of things but um it's important to take time to 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 really model your data over time what do you think that this would look like and you know come up with the best strategy moving forward yeah, I, re I really loved uh, Pascal's slide. I'm going to seal that slide. <laughs> it was just so straightforward. But the, yeah. this idea of um, it being a very much application-centric process, that your, uh, your application design drives your data model, and then that drives what you produce, as, a, as opposed to data model and then build your application on top. It's just a complete mind shift. And it was just very, you know, a very simple way of uh, uh, representing that. And that's what we see, isn't it? We see developers. Uh, drawn to this this type of development, and and uh, they are much closer to the data model. It's just a natural fit. Uh, it seems like more of a continuum uh, uh, as opposed to a, a kind of let you know we'll design the data model and then throw it over um, to the developers afterwards. So that was a really good way of summing it up. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. I really like that slide um, that really summed it up because there's you know there's different groups of people who um, can benefit a lot from Cosmos DB and the, you know, people from the relational world and people who are just learning about NoSQL uh, who don't have any prior database experience. So it's really cool to see you know, the path that they would um, take in, in either route and you know, what's the correct way to do things with NoSQL. Um, yeah, definitely. Another thing I really enjoyed seeing uh, was, uh, you know, how our users are utilizing other Azure services to really, you know, make their experience as best as it possibly can be without them having to manage all this infrastructure um, on premise or on their own on VMs. Like they're just doing this in a serverless kind of way with Azure Functions and connecting that in the three different ways through, uh, you know, measuring changes or through. Um, um, you know, the other the other two ways of, of doing that with with uh, um, uh, with Azure Functions. So that was that was really interesting to see. Yeah, awesome. Um, okay, so it looks like we're at time. So I'm going to uh, close up here and just again, huge thanks to everybody involved uh, with the with the conference. Just been really awesome, and and the presentations today were just I'm literally blown away by the the quality and what what, what people are out there doing. Uh, so just some last things to, to say, if you if this was the first uh, stream that you watched, um, there are 18 on-demand sessions uh, in addition to the live sessions that, uh, that you can uh, get with even more amazing content that's built by our community. Uh, if you want to watch those, you, you just head over to um, aka.ms slash cosmosdbconf. Hopefully that's appearing in the banner. Um, and click on the agenda for the event. You sh you'll uh, see um, what's uh, what's there. Uh, another thing would be, uh, if you've not already, join us for our weekly podcast. Uh, so our, our host and also the mastermind behind this whole uh, event, Mark Brown, uh, meets with members of our team, uh, as well as members of the Cosmos DB community uh, to dive into new, a new topic every week. So uh, if you want to see a, a podcast live or watch it on demand, uh, head over to aka.ms slash Cosmos DB live TV. Uh, hopefully that should be coming up in the banner as well. And finally, if you're new to Cosmos DB, this is the first time you've ever heard about it, 
uh, and you want to find out ways that you can try it out for free, uh, read our blog post at aka.ms slash cosmosdb dash free. Uh, and you'll find out four different ways you can try Cosmos DB, including the free t tier where, uh, where Cosmos DB will be free for the life of the account. That's free. So no excuse <laughs> not to try it out. Uh, so, yeah, again, thanks for joining us to, for our very first co uh, Cosmos DB conference. And we hope to see you again next year. Thank you. <laughs>